the saint of mantralaya extends his grace through intuitive women too it is said that motherhood enjoys the supreme status though women have made giant strides in various other aspects of life too in the spiritual domain however the degree of acceptance of women is much less compared to their counterparts i would hasten to say here that i have however written about many incidents of sri guru raja's grace extended on this category of devotees but some critics who accept them do not however acknowledge things beyond their imaginary periphery such assailants can only be regarded as persons who are averse to women attaining celebrity shri raghavendra is not the one to discriminate on gender basis the bestowal of his grace a certain set of people subscribing to this view are however hesitant to agree with my contention that some women are indeed endowed with his extraordinary grace rather uncommon in part 1 I had written about the mercy extended by Sri Raghavendra to a leprous woman under the chapter Sri Raghavendra graces a woman of poor virtue explaining how Sri Raghavendra had accepted the shawl that ha- she had been using as a cover on her loathsome body I had also brought out in that context why he had done that but some readers are not happy with what I had written In part 5 I have recounted about two savitris but many devotees feel that more could have been said about them I had to then confine myself only to penning the respective roles they had played in the establishment of Brindavanas at two different places Vilivakam Savitri Bai associated with the Chennai Saligramam Ritika Brindavana and new zealand savitri connected with the rk puram mrithika brindavana in hyderabad in fact when i had gone for interviewing vilivakam savitri bai the tapes i had taken for recording her talk were insufficient so much being the matter she could provide for my writing but i had picked from those only such matters as were relevant for immediate publication i had not written then about what she passes on as enlightenment of shri raghavendra to devotee supplications preferred through her about new zealand savitri though i had written in part 5 itself i have not met her so far but only spoken to her over phone i have explained in my serialized work regarding her enquiries about me her concern about my ill health then and my not having compiled uh, complied immediately with the advice she had tendered which she could know about from even beyond the seas as if she were in our midst then leaving me baffled at those experiences in the same volume i had also covered about saubhagyavati saraswati bai who was a person extending a kind of motherly affection to everyone she was maintaining her house like a temple and was ever indulgent in such pujas as could be done by women to shri raghavendra she had disciples all over the country and a large number of admirers were unceasingly approaching her for shri guru raja's guidance proffered through her she was in telephonic contact with me often informing me always in an excited tone the way rai ru shri raghavendra had caused things to happen or telling me about some mysterious occurrences attributable to his extraordinary powers like a child rejoicing at some happenings it sees or is involved in at her invitation my wife and i had visited her place thrice twice to interview her and once to read out the matter that i had put together and set in writing a retired official of the reserve bank of india she was a spinster who was ever prayerful for the well-being of others such good soul reaching the lotus feet of the lord in 2009 her selfless deeds and her life story deserves to be made known to a large number and though i may not be able to write about them 
her disciples like Srimati Padma of Mumbai, I expect, would come forward to accomplish it. In part 4, I had written about one Venubai, affectionately known as Bengaluru Amma. She was one among those who had accompanied me during my Nepal Yatra. I had mentioned in my aforementioned volume that what I had written therein about Lakshmaneshwarar without my visiting the place was solely based on the information furnished to me by her. Readers may well imagine the extent of faith I have in her to write about a place that I had not visited till then. So Venubai, retired from the electricity board, has also been leading a selfless life, praying to Sri Guru Raja on behalf of all and passing on his enlightenment to others on the submissions made by them. Without entering the bond of family life, she has been considering all devotees of Sri Guru Raja as her kinsfolk. Writing about such women enjoying the special grace of Sri Raghavendra, even to the extent necessary to make it known, is considered by some as violative of the Shastraic injunctions. The reasons abused by them are varied, such as their being spinsters or being married and leading a family life with spouse and children or being the ones castigated as barren, though the percentage of such disapproval is only minuscule. I would reiterate here emphatically that without Sri Guru Raja's approval, I cannot pen in this writing about anyone and that all those figuring in this serialized publication are persons who deserve being mentioned, written about. Not being content with the self-consolation, I started praying to Sri Guru Raja to show me a way to make those holding a divergent opinion about this understand the reality. Sri Guru Raja always responds to soulful devotion, a thing that I have myself experienced on numerous occasions. I may cite here an incident corroborative of this. In 1986, my wife had gone to her mother's place for delivery. But one day, I got the shocking message that the child was dead in the womb itself and it was not to be divulged to the mother and that I should go over there at once. With great anxiety when I went there, the doctors opined that her health condition was not fit for surgery, but there were chances for normal delivery of the dead infant. Though overcome by grief, I controlled my sobs and without telling my wife the un unfortunate position she was in, ran at once to Tirkargaur and brought from there an oil sanctified by divine incantations to the principal goddess of that place to be used by my wife. Incidentally, I had learned about that place only then. Thereafter, we waited till the date indicated by the doctors. And to our great relief, the delivery of the dead infant took place in the normal way without surgical intervention. And when I later told our relatives about the reason for it, that is the divine protection, none believed it and some even mocked at me adding fuel to the fire that was burning in my heart. Much later, when my wife was again in the family way, I was going to that holy place every month, composing songs there in praise of the deity and rendering those in the company of my wife. As a result of such ardent and relentless devotion, my first daughter Vedika was born and later Aishwarya too as the second one. Even after the birth of my first child, the non-believers thought that we had coined some cock and bull story about the infant that had earlier died in the womb, saying that it should have died immediately after its birth and not in the womb itself as made out by us. As I am ever dependent on Sri Guru Raja and have staunch belief in him, a news item that appeared in the papers then seemed to provide an answer to those who had jeered at me. The item pertained to some foreign doctors having come to treat Chief Minister Karunanidhi's granddaughter who was carrying a dead infant in her womb and it said that they had opined that a dead child can remain in the mother's womb 
for even 28 to 30 days without any danger to the mother there being good scope for even normal delivery in such cases this had appeared in the dinatandi daily of 12 10 1989 of course after the publication of this news those who had ridiculed me learned the truth about my wife's case too with this experience i penned a work titled karunai poriyum shri garbarakshambikai meaning the merciful goddess who protects the womb which is now serving as a guide to a large number of families the composition on the goddess of mangadu for 6 weeks rendering titled as 6 weeks songs and the songs composed on garbarakshambikai for 10 months rendering are popular now and helping many driving home the message that steadfast divine worship even in the midst of adversities will redeem one from miseries circumventing all obstacles this aspect has been highlighted here to underline the truth that it is only by prayer and unflagging devotion to sri guru raja that we can cause him to make those who mock at our actions realize the truth and repent for their unseemly demeanor in sri raghavendra mahimai writings i have recounted in many places about women and their involvement in spirituality drawing attention in many a case to the abundant grace of sri guru raja that they were privileged to enjoy as a result of which they were guiding others in their lives as enlightened by sri raghavendra some people not falling in line with my views had proffered criticisms which i thought deserved a repost from my side so i was praying to sri guru raja about it and was blessed with an answer through an incident involving sri sumati indra tirtha what that happening was follows in the next two chapters